Let's turn our attention back to Africa. We've already talked about some of the early Erectus material from Africa, but let's talk about the later or middle Pleistocene material from Africa. Unfortunately, the fossil record in East Africa after about a million years of age isn't as good as it is earlier in time, so our record is a little bit more spotty. It also spans a larger geographic range in Africa than in the earlier samples that we saw predominantly focused in the East African Rift Valley. Nevertheless, if we look at Africa, we can see a number of important sites. Some of them again coming from the East African Rift Valley. From Ethiopia and Eritrea, we have sites like Buya, Bodo, and Dhaka. From Tanzania, we have specimens from Indutu. Also specimens from Olduvai Gorge still and some of the later beds of Olduvai Gorge. We have a specimen from Kabwe, actually, in Zambia, and then some South African specimens, including Saldana. There are also specimens from North Africa at this time period, including an important assemblage of mandibles, that some of which you've actually already seen in this class, from the site of Ternifine. So looking at this a little bit more closely, we can talk about some of the trends. OH-16 is one of the earlier Homo erectus materials from Olduvai Gorge. OH-9, dated maybe to 1.2 million years of age, although possibly a little bit more recent than that, is later in time. In the trend, you can see there's similarity in terms of the morphology of these specimens. Both have a double-arched superorbital torus that extends fairly continuously into a fairly long sloping frontal. You have much more of a superorbital sulcus in the OH9 specimen associated with the larger superorbital torus in general. And indeed, one of the things you can see is that evidence of dramatically increasing robusticity across this time period. The overall support structures of the cranial vault, including the superorbital torus, the features of the temporal line, including the angular torus on the back, the sagittal keel and a keel that runs down the midline of the skull are all increasing across this time period, going from the lower Pleistocene to the middle Pleistocene. So that first half of the evolution of Erectus, again evidenced by specimens here in Africa, shows an increasing size and robusticity of these structures of the skull. Across Africa, though, you can see this trend continue as we move from OH9 early in the middle Pleistocene, or even still in the lower Pleistocene, to Saldana, a specimen from South Africa that's in the middle Pleistocene, much later in time. And again, you can see similarities in terms of the overall structure and shape of these cranial vaults, but with an increase in brain size across this time period. So one of the trends, again, that we see throughout the erectus lineage is increasing cranial capacity over time. We see it going from something like OH9 at 1.2 million years of age at about 800 to 1,000 cc's to something like Saldana that's more like 1,200 cc's. So increasing cranial capacity is another one of the trends that we see throughout the erectus lineage. Here's a specimen, Buia, coming again from the northern edge of the Rift Valley. And one of the things that we'll see throughout the African samples, unlike, say, the Southeast Asian samples, or the East Asian samples, or the European samples, is that there's more variability within the African sample. Now, I'll talk in a moment about why this is the case, but Buia is a good example of that. Buia is an interesting specimen as having very thick superorbital tori running as essentially a continuous bar across the front of the face. Notice the skull itself is actually quite narrow. It has a very sort of boxy appearance compared to some of those earlier specimens which we've seen from Southeast Asia and East Asia, even the Demonisi specimens. Other features of the Buia specimen include a very flat vertical face, we see a long cranial vault that in many ways echoes what we saw in the specimens from Southeast Asia, coupled with a low cranial vault. It has a fairly long frontal bone, but one with more frontal bossing or projection across the middle of the structure than those specimens we saw in Southeast Asia. Here, just slightly later in time, we have this specimen from Bodo coming from Ethiopia. And here we see a very different version of what a middle Pleistocene African Homo erectus specimen looks like. Instead of a continuous bar across the top, we have instead a more of a double arch superorbital torus. It's still very thick, but with even a little bit of gap actually in the center. So this arch is not continuous across the specimen, but rather separated by a gap in the glabella region. We have a little bit of a frontal keel, much like we have on some of the Asian specimens. Looking at the face of Bodo, unlike that narrow face that we saw in the Buia specimen, Bodo has a more laterally projecting face, again like we saw in some of the East Asian specimens. Here's a cast of Bodo that demonstrates that more effectively, where we can see similarities perhaps between Bodo and Sandron 17 from Southeast Asia, where we can see the broad midface that we associate with some of these middle Pleistocene Homo erectus remains. Moving slightly forward in time again, we can see two more specimens. Kabwe, coming from Zambia, shown here on the right, and Ndutu, coming from Tanzania on the left. And again, we can see contrasting pictures and variability. Kabwe has one of the largest superorbital tori that we know of in the Pleistocene record, but one that thins as it goes laterally a little bit. So it's more projecting and thick in the center than it is in the lateral margins. 
Uh, we can see that actually in the specimen shown here. Here's a cast of cobwe. And you can see these very, very thick superorbital tori that thin as they both go centrally and laterally. There's also a little bit of a gap that separates these two arches. So in some ways, this is more similar to Bodo than it is to specimens like Indutu, which we'll see here in just a moment, or the Buia specimen that we already looked at. We again have a very long cranial vault. Cabo has a very strong projecting nuchal torus here in the back of the skull. And overall, it's a fairly large, flat vertical face with this only slight prognathism in the lower part of the face. It has zygomatics or cheeks that face largely anteriorly, although as you go lateral to the orbit, they face more laterally. In due to preserve some of the same morphology, although it has more of a projecting superorbital torus, although less thick, it has a more exaggerated nasal appearance, more like actually some of the European specimens. It has a less projecting occiput, more like some of the European specimens than we see in this nuchal torus here on the cobway. And the overall structure is quite different. And again, what we see in the African specimens is a lot of variation. More variation across time and space than we see in the other specimens. One of the reasons for this is that Africa is simply very, very large. Compared especially to the landmass of Europe, especially the habitable landmass in the Pleistocene during glacial time periods, Africa is much larger. Africa probably is much larger than the habitable landmass of Asia too in the Pleistocene. Africa is also recalled the place where Homo erectus first originates. So it's the origin point. It's also probably the place that's had the largest population of hominids throughout the entire hominid record, including the Pleistocene. So it might not be surprising that the point of origin, the geographic center, the largest area, the place that has the largest population size, also has the most variability. This is something that we might predict using basic evolutionary principles, that Africa is going to be more variable throughout most of the Pleistocene. And indeed, in a genetic standpoint, Sub-Saharan African populations today remain the most variable of any on the planet. The reason, again, is that that's where we originate. There's more retained variation because it's the source of all these populations. So as we look across the African record, unlike the very distinctive features that we see in other specimens, we see more variability. Here is a well-preserved specimen from Ethiopia from the site of Dhaka that again gives evidence of that. Here again we have a double arched superorbital torus, but one that's continuous across the front of the skull. It doesn't have the gap in the middle like we saw at Kabwe or Bodo. And yet it doesn't have the flat one that we saw at Buia. It has the double arched appearance. It has a little bit of a frontal keel, but in general has a broad sloping forehead. It lacks the angular torus that we saw in earlier specimens like OH9. Uh, we don't have a preserved face on Daca, unfortunately. But again, it demonstrates the variability that we find in these middle Pleistocene African Homo erectus remains. Two specimens that we've already seen, if you recall the mystery fossil discussion section that we had earlier in the class, are these two specimens. These are two mandibles from the North African site of Turnifine. And actually, there's a third that's part of this assemblage as well. These are very large mandibles. They're very robust in terms of the overall proportions of the corpus. They have actually quite large teeth compared to middle Pleistocene specimens. And again, they demonstrate this evolution in the first half of the Homo erectus lineage of increasing size and robusticity, one of the trends that we see throughout the Homo erectus lineage. Now, in a moment, we'll try and recap this regional variation, talking about what are the evolutionary forces that might have shaped these regional patterns of variation.